Okay, as you, as you may be aware, we are also recording as many of these sessions as we can. Uh, they will be available for you um, either as an as MP4 file or they'll be recorded, the webinars, the ones that we're broadcasting as webinars, and we will send out the links to those uh, recordings for you uh, when we get back home. Uh, this morning I'm going to cover exhaustion, as I say, how to identify when a ticker is exhausted and move up or down and what to do next. Uh, mostly this is um, covering all the sorts of things you see when you're in a position, uh, when you get to the top of a move. It's not um, like a trailing stop exit strategy. This is just kind of signs that a move to the upside or the downside may be coming to an end. Oh, I need to click this on here. There we go. So there's the agenda in this uh, session this morning. Going to look at uh, exhaustion gaps. Got a nice little bit of uh, EDS code for exhaustion gaps, and you know, part of the thing with a gap up, you can have a gap up when you're in a move uh, to the upside or the gap down to the downside is not necessarily mean that the move is exhausted, but there are some other signs at, at that time when you get those sorts of gaps that can give an indication that the move might be over. So we'll look at that. Uh, real basic one, rising channel breakout, or it could be rising channel down breakout if you're in a short position. You know, how you identify that, what really uh, is a break in and not just a, a sort of a, a slight move above the channels you might have drawn on the, uh, on the uh, price action. Uh, candlesticks is not something I do a great deal on, but uh, a doji is uh, kind of an interesting one as well. You often get a doji at, uh, at a particular pivot point or at the top of a move to the upside or to the downside. Uh, volatility fade. You know, when the volatility starts going out, we'll look at that. Also what I call a volatility rollover, where we're looking at a slightly longer term average of volatility as an indication that things may be uh, finishing in a, a particular move. The VIX exit strategy, that's the kind of the new thing I was looking at, which is, we'll see later is kind of nice to look, you'd be able to see what the VIX does versus the spiders. Uh, historical volatility exit on a 21 day historical volatility is quite good too and a little bit about volume exhaustion. So I call this the runaway. This is uh, talking about really at some point when you're in a position. It's great, you know, you come in the more, you start the market, it opens up in the morning, you've got a position and it's running away from you. It's gapped up two or three points. It's a, it's a nice feeling, but uh, it can mean that, you know, there's something, something's going on here. This could be just a runaway exhaustion. It could just be the beginning of some sort of huge parabolic move actually identifying whether it's a continuation of the trend going on or this is a sign that maybe we're coming to the end. I call this the this exhaustion gap. And as we know, you know, gaps in price action tend to get filled. They do get tend to get filled at least somewhere along the way. You know, that gap is 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 almost an aberration in, in the price action. You know, for some reason or other, whatever it is, it's some news, some rumor that made that happen in the first place, more often than not, sometime in the near future that gap's going to get filled. And if you're in a long position, you're probably in a, in a frame of mind that you want to get out of the position before it starts to think about filling that gap. But as I said, it's not necessarily so. It's not necessarily an exit. When you see that gap go up, it may continue going on up. However, this is what I've looked at as an exhaustion gap as opposed to just a gap up in price, which may gap up again another day and keep moving. An exhaustion gap is usually a 5% gap between the high of the previous day and the low of the gap day. So that's kind of a, a rule of thumb I use for an exhaustion gap. But the other key triggers here are the volume, 50% above the 21-day average. So you've got those two factors in, face, uh, in place to start with. And then the gap data closes usually below the open. Now this is, you know, you get other sorts of gaps, it's the same, but this is kind of the sign that it's an exhaustion gap. It's kind of run away real quickly, but look what happens at the end. The close has gone back down to below the open. So the signs that there's no more momentum that's going to continue in this powerful gap away move. There's my usual code stuff up here. Let me just run through a few things in here. This again, this is an exhaustion gap, so it's not just a, you know, you can find gaps all the time in price action, but this is the exhaustion gap. First thing we said, remember the volume is, is, is pretty significant on the day of the gap. 
Remember I said the close is below the open on that gap day, so it's kind of faded away at the end of the day. There's some other factors in here. Don't worry about the code, I'll just explain this to you. It must have gained 10% over the last 30 days. So this is, you know, you might have bought into the stock and it's gone up nicely over those 30 days. And it also, remember this is the 5% gap up move we've had here. There's a couple of other things that are in here as well. I've taken two moving averages, but the 30 must have stayed above the 200 during that period of time. In this case, it's going to be uh, the 30, you know, the, the uh, 30 days that we're looking at. So what you're looking at here is a stock that's been in a good trend to the upside. You have some confirming factors in here that say, yeah, it's been a steady trend. It hasn't uh, given back very much of the move to the upside. You've had a sudden 5% or more runaway gap on good volume, but together with this closing below the open on that gap day. So this is a rule again. This one's up on the... Uh, up on the AIQ server. Hey, it's not online in here. This is good. So you can actually see the uh, link. So download that and have a look at it. It's, it's really, really good because it, every one of these stocks that I had this run and pick out uh, were all exhaustion gaps. They weren't gaps that then continued on afterwards. They all faded away afterwards. And I, I really think the clue to this is, uh, you know, if you have positions or you're looking at, uh, you know, you have stocks that do this type of thing, you see that big volume and the gap up, and especially this close is below the open on that gap day, there's a sign that this move may be over. Steve? Yeah? Does the scan any function require you to reset the date when you're done to move on, or does it automatically put it back where it was? No, well, the scan any date uh, in this particular <laughs> instance will go back to where it was before. Yeah, I don't have to do a reset date on this one. Yeah. There, there are instances, depending on what rules you have in there and what functions, where you may have to do that. Especially if you you know you set the rule date, you know that you go and get the date where the scan any happened, and you're trying to run some more functions after that. Yeah, then you have to think about what you're doing because otherwise it'll start scanning the next rule back from that date it just found. It's at that time you need to reset the date back to the beginning. So, but in in this instance, it's a real simple one. I mean, I use scan any in a reverse mode. I say I don't want to see any time in the last 30 days where the 30-day average has gone below the 200-day average. So it's just, a, as long as that rule doesn't fire, I'm happy. So that's a real simple simple way of using it. Steve? Yeah. I'm just curious, something you just said there. Yeah. If I had a scan any and it fires, and in the same rule I follow it with another scan and would that actually start scanning from where the first one ended back? So like, what I'm thinking of, gee, can I find multiple peaks yeah, I, I know what you're saying, and no, you can't because, and, and let, you, you can't do it on, you can do it, but you're going to have to put a rule, something in there to set the date. There is a way of doing that. It's setting the date to when it's found the scan any. So there's there's a particular order of doing things. If you had just two scan any's in there, mm -hmm. it'll run the first scan any return this value on this date. It'll run the second one from back to the beginning again and it'll find the second date. They'll, they'll be disconnected from each other. But there are methods you can use. Is that um, Yeah, actually, you probably have to have a look at, um, I think the function is either um, report, get report date, something like that. There is a function that does it. So you just do a get, and that'll set the date. Yeah, because you run the scan any, you get the report date, and then you run the next one after that. So it runs from the date where it found that particular instance, and then it moves back in time. So then you could go, do multiple of those. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 you can do that. So here's a, this is a typical um, exhaustion gap uh, stock. You got a nice little price action move to the upside here. You might have been long from here, you're going up here. Then you get this runaway gap more than 5% with the big volume. I don't have the moving averages on here. You just have to take my word that the 30 is above the 200 throughout this period. And what happens on this gap day up here and uh, the actual close, the opens are a little hard to see on some of these, but the close is right towards the bottom of the range on that gap day. That's a sign that this is really over. This, this move is gone. There's just no more momentum to the upside. Whatever, we don't care what drove this sudden spike in volume. We don't care why it went up like that. All we care about is, is that it's had this criteria with the gap and the close has ended up right down or below the open on the day. When you see that happen, things start fading away after that. Volume starts uh, disappearing. The move starts to fade away. And you notice, you know, of course, fills the gap. 
So how would you, if you were in this long position, you'd probably watch this during the day very closely. When it opened in the morning, it probably opened up pretty strongly towards the high. And as the day went on, you probably saw the, you know, the, the range was beginning to, the trades were beginning to move towards the lower end of the day. And you might get out of that point rather than you know, wait any further. Maybe the next day if you're just a you know, end of day trader. And there's another one, CTSH. This was on um, August the 4th of this year. Same type of thing. You get this great big runaway. You've had a pretty good move to the upside. I mean, in this particular case, really from the 46 level up to the sort of 56 level, it's a nice move up. And again, you get this great big gap on huge volume. But the clue that this is not going to continue is the closing price right there is right towards the bottom of the range. So again, you've got this, there's no real commitment. Whatever caused this gap to happen is just not going to continue to the upside. I mean, we've all seen stocks where you gap up one day, it consolidates for two or three more days, and it might continue to the upside again. But when you see this every time, every time I run this, you see this. You see this pattern. It just bang, and then it's over. I think might be like dumb money getting in and smart money is getting out. Yeah, yeah, it could be. You know, this is this some, some, it's probably some news story that was already built into the, into the price action mostly, and, and now you've got the dumb money flying in here. Because look at the amount of volume up here. I mean, it's a, all of these spikes like this, you, you see the same thing happening again. The stock's been doing you know, reasonably well. That's to say that uh, the, the 30 is above the 200-day moving average. And during this period, and then you get this sudden spike up, but there's no commitment there. When that closes right towards the bottom of the day like that, it's just a sign that it's over. See, they all, they all look the same. That they all look the same. The same thing happens again. You get a nice move here, <coughs> this runaway gap, huge volume, closes right down here. Open was actually right in the middle of the range there. It closes right towards the bottom. It's over every time. What, what percentage of them filled the gap? Actually, the, the one, I ran about 15 or 20 of them. And I just took um, three examples out there. Almost all of them filled the gap. One kind of never filled the gap, but most of them filled the gap. Uh, you know, I haven't back tested this. It's all yours, Steve. You can take it. Send me the results, and if it works, we'll keep the secret. I'll do that. Okay. These, that's are, these are not uh, announced in right? These are just so... Uh, no, they're, no they're, they're, they're just... These are just... Um, you know, I don't really know. The actual gap... This gap exhaustion rule, this was some research that was in stocks and commodities a few years ago. I pulled this out, uh, had a look at it, ran a few strategies... Um, and you know there was nothing I really needed to change in this rule at all. You know finding gaps was easy. Here's a gap here. You know if this was five percent, but these don't meet the criteria of this type of move up when you have this gap. In fact, you know this is to me this rule is great for shorts. Yeah, it's really a great short move. Right, so, that's what you found. The shorting. I know that's, that's and that's you know it's an exhaustion of a move up, but it's a great short. And they and they all have this pattern because we're looking for that 30 above the 200 day. Uh, we're also looking for this, you know, this big volume spike, but it's the gap, I think, as well as important. It's 5%. I mean, that's an arbitrary figure. No one seems to explain when they come up with, you know, 5% just because we've got five fingers. I don't know. I mean, maybe it's... I, I met a guy that earns a living from just this pattern. Oh, really? <clears throat> he was at a seminar, and of course, all the financial people say, you, well, you're an idiot to short things in a bull market that are moving on. Yeah. But, but no, it's... This was the only pattern this, and it, but it, it has some truth to it, and, and I really think this is the, the critical thing is this close on that runaway bar, because if there was real, you know, a real series of buyers coming in, that thing would probably have closed up towards the high for the day, and it might continue. And this runaway gap might be you know, something really important. I have no idea what caused the gap. I, you could do some research and find out. It could be any number of news stories. But in all of these cases, we're, we're looking at the same type of thing. The gap gets filled. Some of them are more dramatic when they pull back. But in either way, I think you're right. This is a great shorting opportunity. As soon as you see this thing is going to be closing towards the lower range of the day there, it's a great time to go short. So that's it kind of just, I mean, it's, it's a simple strategy. Um, let's not talk exhaustion. Let's talk going short. I like this. It is, it really is good. I mean, and it, and, you know, when I go back, for, go back. Look at these charts. Don't they look very similar? They all do. They all have the similar type of thing going on here. You get the gap run away, and that gap gets filled. I mean, you could trade these 
for a nice short. I mean, it's going to be, it's pretty dramatic. It's only over a period of maybe 10 or 15 days here. And that's a, that's a nice, easy one for a short play. There's no, you know, no real shakeout in this particular move down to here. This one's a little tougher because you got this little bit here. You know, if you went short here, you kind of be waffling around going, is this thing really going to, you know, I might have I made the right move? And then it's kind of just a little gap there to the downside, but then it rallies back up again. This one's nice, though. So again, it's, you know, you've got the move to the upside. You know, the, the criteria in this scan, and it's, and it's just, you know, it's a strange way to look at things. It's, um, if you had this scan and you had a list of stocks, and one of these stocks was a stock that you owned and you were along, and you saw this happen, you'd probably want to get out. I certainly wouldn't want to stay in. And again, I just reiterate, it's that closed below the open. You know, if there was real commitment, this thing would have been flying to the end of the day. It'll be up here, and there'll be more buyers waiting to come in the next morning to take this higher. But that's not what happened. So the volume there, you're right, this is, this is, a, this is a bunch of uh, <laughs> people who are fools, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Hey, look, this stock's running away. It's going to go to 25 by the end of the week. Yeah, sure. That's part of the Goldman, uh, uh, you put some of the buy list and the Goldman traders sell it. That's right. Yeah, they're, all, they're probably up there to <laughs> say, yeah, guys, you've got to buy this while we're selling it behind the scenes. Can you, can you put a stock on the screen? Yeah, we can do that later. Yeah, because I, I, otherwise I'll have to switch everything around. But uh, yeah, we can certainly do that. Okay, so some a couple of other um, simple exhaustion signs. Uh, rising channel breakdown. I'm sure we've all seen this sort of, you know, a number of times. You know, you've ridden a stock up. You know, you've probably stayed in the position because there's a pretty good channel to the upside or the downside in place. It's figuring out when it gets out of that nice range and when it's time to break out. Because most times, you know, I'm, you know what it's like when you're drawing trend lines and you're trying to figure out where you are. You're connecting the points together. Am I just trying to make everything fit for what my frame of mind says it should be? But in most channels, it's pretty obvious. When you see a channel to the upside or downside, if you're in a long position there, that channel is a pretty good frame of reference because you know that other guys are drawing the same thing. You know, if they're along the stock, they're doing the same thing. Okay, I see it's pulled back to this channel here once or twice already. I can see on the upside it's done the same thing. I've got a decent looking channel in place. That's a good frame of reference for me to stay in the position while it's within that channel. But when it breaks out of the channel, you know, often there's a pickup in volume is the clue that this channel is going to begin to break down. So for example, here's, you know, Hewlett Packard was just phenomenal in 09. I mean, this, this stock really, anytime you got into the position here, once you got into this nice tight channel up here, you could have actually drawn another channel line along here and just written this all the way up. You know, the upper channel again. The upper channel I just tend to keep up there just for as a reference point because you know, if you're in a long position already, if it breaks out of the channel on the upside, hey, that's fine. I'm happy with that. But it's when it breaks down through here. You know, this particular channel is really connecting these particular low points to here. Now remember, I've drawn this line, so your channel might be different. You may be connecting this one or this one. You may have this channel running through here. But the clue that it's out of this range, whether you take the narrow range or the larger range here, is the breakdown that happens on a pickup in volume. You see that spike of volume right there? I mean, that's the biggest spike in volume you've had since back over here, long way back in time. When you get that happening and there's a dramatic breakdown through this channel like that, it's, it's pretty much a sign that the move is over. It's not going to go up any further. Again, it's the volume is the clue on this one. This one, you know, it's a, if, if you had the line along here and you just you got into the position somewhere around here and you were following it up through these pullbacks, on this particular day here, the volume wasn't particularly great. It might have broken through your channel, but you may have waited until the volume really started to pick up at this point here. Because you just don't know. Remember, this is hindsight. I can see this here. But if I took away this section of the price chart here, you'd be hard-pressed to say whether we're still in a channel or not. But the clue is, once we're down through, a couple of days through here, and then we start to see this pickup in volume as it's broken through, I'm willing to give back you know, a few points here just to confirm the fact that the channel is broken. And that's really what you're looking for. Because you could have second-guessed yourself. If you said, oh, yeah, look, I can see the channel. In hindsight, I would have got out over here. Yeah, right, but then you probably would have got out over here if you'd had the channel tighter there. 
it's the volume really that gives the, it's the clue. When you have a significant pickup in volume and you've got this type of move down here, once we got to about here, we already had four or five days to the downside, volume was picking up, you can pretty much see this move is going to be over. Yeah, could, you could have done a, yeah, you could have done a Bollinger Band squeeze. Yes, again, you, th those types of things uh, uh, could be indicative of the, of the move being over. But here's another nice one. This is uh, I'm getting click happy here. This is this is uh, Ko back from uh, earlier in this year. Same type of thing. You've got a sort of a nice channel here. It's rising up. Hits the hits a bit of resistance here. Comes back down again. Gets a little bit of support from this level here and this channel you've drawn comes back up, doesn't quite get there, but it's still going to the upside. And during that time, you get you know, little bits of volume here. There's a bit of a spike right here. But it isn't until you get to here where you get a, a significant move to the downside through the channel itself. And again, you've got this nice pickup in volume right here. It's not as significant as some of these other spikes, but this spike here was up near the top. So this one behaved a little differently. But once you get out of a channel like that, and again, the volume is picked up, you know, this was interesting because the volume picked up right here, and it was right here where we had an almost complete lack of volume. This is another one of those signs. We'll look at it a little bit later when the volume fades away like that. I mean, look how vo low the volume is there. Yeah, we know where this is. It's in December. But still, the volume, this is probably the lowest point in volume that we've had for almost a year on this stock. And that's happened right at the top of the move to the upside. So it's pretty much run out of steam. There's no more buyers out there. It's kind of reached that top uh, level there. It's the, you know, the highest level for a long time. Then it starts to pull back. There's not a lot of ha you know, trade happening at that point. But once we start getting back down to this level here, we're starting to see a huge pickup in volume again. And it's a sign that this move is completely over. If you'd seen something like... Uh, if this had just been a standard volume at the peak of this, uh, of this particular move up in the channel here, it's just kind of a regular volume days, and it had continued that way, it could have got to the bottom of the band and just continued up, moving up again. But once you had this kind of fade out in volume at the top, followed by a pickup in volume as we started accelerating away from the peak, you know, this channel is no longer valid. You get out of that channel, the volume's broken through right here. You know, if you're in long, you better be out of there pretty quickly. And you always get this kind of, you know, you see this often. You get this, everybody sees these trend lines like this. I mean, look at this, look when it hit the channel right there. I mean, it's perfect. As soon as it hit there, everybody else has got the same trend line on there. They're all going, oh, yeah, there. Yeah. It's just hit the bottom of the channel again, so they go back in. Or they, or they may just stay in the position. But either way, you can see this sort of, the channel is working very well. But once it violates it here, it gets through to this area. There's a shakeout, and there's this little period where it's kind of consolidated for a while, but the volume's still, you know, pretty significant. Now we're in a range, and you know, if you if you trade longs, if you are holding this long, you don't want to be in the range. So this is when you're out of here. You know, this channel is is violated. It's gone. So any questions on channels? I mean, they're they're fairly straightforward. I think. Um, you know, as long as the volume picks up when it breaks through the channel, again, you know, channels mostly you draw yourself. We have a tool that draws channels for you, but again, you know, they're, it's computer code, so the channels can be a little bit goofy at times, you know, trying to do that. This is one of those things where you, you draw your own channels, and I mean, everybody can see where that trend line was going up, right? Everybody, everybody here can draw that trend line. So if we're all drawing it and we're in that long position, then we probably all see the same thing. If it breaks down below that, you know, we've got a trigger right there that something might be, uh, it might be time to get out of a long position. And the same works on the short side. Okay, so the third one we're going to look at is, the, uh, is a candlestick doji. I don't, as I say, use a lot of candlesticks. I do like them on, as a price chart because it's just easy to see you know, where, where the price action is because you've got a lot of price bars on a page. Sometimes it's hard to see relationships between the high and the low as, as far as the close and open are concerned. So th they do make nice charts. Um, this candle pattern is pretty good for, a, for the end of a move to the upside and to the downside. You know, there's, as I said, there's a lot of different patterns out there, as, as Steve Palmquist knows. You still, you still like candlesticks. Yeah. They're, they're kind of... When the market's moving, I think mm. they're good. In, in trading ranges, I don't use them very much. They're, they get a lot of problems. But in 
when the market's either trending up or down, I'm yeah, I tend to tend to agree because I did a lot. Of, I mean, I read your book and all the back testing you did, and it's you know there's there's uh, you do have to be in in the right sort of market to make these things work. Okay, let me just explain quickly what the Doji is if you if you've not used this before. It's very popular. The stock opens up and goes nowhere throughout the day, and it closes right on near the opening price. And in candlesticks, uh, you know that you end up then with the body of the candlestick basically disappears becomes uh, almost a flat line or does become a flat line. And it represents indecisions between buyers and sellers. You, you get to this the point in a trend where during the trend you've been having small pullbacks, but it's continued up to the upside again, the pullbacks continue to the upside, and you reach this point where there's this indecision and nothing happens, very little happens during that day. And it's going to often trigger, you know, this is the, the end of a move to the up or the downside, and you're going to get a reversal. So this is what it looks like right here. And the thing that we're really looking for, for when it's completely exhausted at the top, is the doji is kind of standing out on its own. You see here the bar on the left and the bar on the right. The bodies of both of those bars are below the body of the doji itself. When you see that type of doji, that's used to sign the end of a move. You can get dojis appearing in, you know, in, in middles of moves to the upside, but it's usually the bar on the left or the bar on the right is higher than the doji. But when you see it in isolation like this, it's usually a sign that the move is over. So you have that happen, and then it starts to change and move back to the downside. And this one's uh, AXP, American Express, on uh, August the 2nd. Notice also, remember I said in the last uh, slide when you got to the top, we, we all know we get this diminished volume when you get to the very top of a move up. And again, you, you see the same sort of thing here. There's, you know, the volume's kind of faded away down here. Both those combined together is a sure sign that there's, uh, you know, the move may be over. So if you're in a long position here, you, know, you might have got stopped out here. But remember, this doji, this is a doji is not the classic um, standing about the uh, bars on each side. This bar is much bigger to, than uh, this particular one. Chris, what you got on that one, Steve, is two different things. Four ticks before you have what they call a bearish engulfing pattern. Yeah, I've got. I looked at all those too. We could do. You could do candlesticks all day. I mean, there's. And you know, the thing I found with candlesticks is that you get so many different patterns occurring. You got a bearish engulfing followed by this bullish pattern followed by this one over the period of two or three days, and and some of the patterns out there are incredibly complex. You know, they're like the they they you know the harami and stuff like that. Um, things that encompass also four or five different patterns in the bars itself and you know, I just look for simplicity things like this anytime it's away from the bars on each side just seems to be a, is a very simple um, measure that something's happened on a move to the upside and here you've got the same thing the body here is away from the two bodies on either side so again it's, it seems like when you have that indecision happening on the bars on either side are not, you know, that they're definitely away from the body of the, uh, of the doji itself. It's usually a sign of a change of direction. <clears throat> a lot of people will use candlesticks and not realize that most of them are one day patterns. And you don't yeah. expect a one day pattern to control the stock price for three weeks. They're very short term. They, they are. In, the, the, in and the, cases, yeah. Because th this is, I don't consider the doji really is a candlestick pattern. It just happens to be a candlestick pattern. It's a, it's a point where buyers and sellers have just gone dead. I mean, there's nothing happening. And when it happens with the diminished volume in here, you know that something's happened. It's over. You know, the move's faded away. I mean, every, on this move to the upside here, once, look at the volume. It's just, it's just petering away. And you get down to right here, and you're at the point where you get this doji, and the volume's just vanished. Well, no one's interested. Yep, yep, you can do, yep, the island top is a, is, is a very similar type of thing. So again, the same, same here, you know, this one's, a, this was kind of a very, very quick move down after this uh, doji up here. And again, you've got this isolated away from the bars on either side. The volume is not really, it's just faded away a little bit. So this one was kind of, uh, doesn't always work, of course. I find it actually, it's good on the top side. On the downside, it's a little harder to get it right. Maybe because um, you know you have increased volatility when you're going down, and this pattern, when it occurs, there's usually some other factors that are playing in there. 
But yeah, so the doji is, um, and as you say, the island top, I forget the actual definition of an island top. It's this, there's, got a, there's another factor in there. But it is that it's in isolation from the bodies of the bars on each side that gives it the significance, together with this thing where the volume is just vanished. So there's, you know, buyers and sellers are going, hey, it's, I'm done, there's nobody else wants to buy, no one's ready yet to sell, and it just sits there. No trading, very little trading, you know, volume was probably, you know, maybe 70% below the average, I mean, a long way down. So we've done the uh, oh, exhaustion gap, we've done the uh, trading uh, range breakout on volume and the doji, especially when you have the low volume at the top of a move, uh, it's a pretty good signal. Volatility is, uh, is one of my favorite things, you know, volatility fade, a bullish exhaustion, and this happens again once the moves continue up to the upside, it keeps going up. You've got uh, great liquidity on the way up, but at some point you get to a situation where you run out of buyers. The range in the day may start to narrow, and you can watch the volume start falling off. You know, watch the 21-day average of volatility to bottom out and start rising. There's a sign that you know we've reached the top of a move to the upside, and now maybe there are some sellers coming in, and they're going to make the volatility start to increase. And it's a sign that downside pressure is beginning, and the up move is exhausted. We're going to do, actually we've got two or three bets on volatility because I like volatility. It is a very good indicator. So this is, we'll start with a simple straightforward. Um, this is the spiders on 429.10, extreme low volatility, the end of an uptrend. I mean, this is, this is the 21 day historical volatility. So it's nothing special. It's just standard 21 day historical volatility with the moving average this is the 21 day, so the 21 day average running through the price action. It's the average that really gives us that smooth uh, indication where there's tops and bottoms in moves. I mean, when you get to the top of the price action right here, I mean, the volatility has vanished. It's completely disappeared. Once that volatility begins to rise, once this curve starts going back up again, this is a pretty good sign that the sellers coming in the market, the day's ranges are getting wider, and that the top move is over. Any time you get into a situation when you've been riding a move to the upside and you start seeing this happening right around here, the volatility is flattening out and it starts to, especially the 21 day, starts to turn the other way again. It's a pretty good sign that uh, there's some sellers coming into the market and this is going to be the end of the move. How are you measuring volatility? This is just a 21 day uh, average historical volatility. It's the indicator that's an AIQ. Okay. That's, that's the standard indicator in there. And I think the indicator itself um, does come with the 21-day average line. And I like the average line because, it, again, it smooths out all those inconsistencies in here. But you notice, you, know, you, you tend to get these right at the bottom here is, is right when the move is over. When the volatility is, is severely depressed like this is when the move to the upside is over. So if you're in any long position and you're looking at historical volatility, you see yourself down here and it starts to flatten out you know, it might be time to tighten stops. Or if you're already starting to see this curve start moving up again, this is a sign, as I said, you know, money's dropping out of this stock. People are trying to dump it. The volatility is increasing. And it's happening because, you know, sellers are coming in there. The range is got up here. The range started getting really wide in the day. People are dumping the stock. And that's just a standard volatility indicator. You have it in, you have it in the system. So keep an eye on it. There are times, you know, where you see these types of bottoms like this that are the clearest signals that the move is over. There are times, obviously, when a, when a stock or it's moving in a range, uh, it's less easy to tell what's going on. But it's certainly, if you've, if you've made money on this move to the upside here, and you see this, it's time to get out. You don't want to see this happen. This, this was nice down here. When this was going on, when you're going down and down and down and down and down, and this is rising, this is great. We like to see that. There's no what's happening here is everybody's everybody's happy in the game. Everybody's going on board buying. There's no there's no uh, imbalance. There's no pressure from sellers. It's it's like it's like an ordered environment right here. But once you get down the bottom here and you start seeing this turning around again, bang, this is over. Something bad's going to happen. Something bad did happen.
So that's just the 21 day average volatility, especially on moves to the upside when it bottoms out, starts curving back up. You know, that's the sign that the move is over. It's time to get out. This is the volatility rollover, the bearish exhaustion. This is a little difference. You know, volatility tends to increase in down moves as liquidity for seller starts uh, drying up. Things start getting pushed down. As the 21 day volatility tops out and starts to decline, the short move may be over. So it's the reverse. It's kind of the reverse of what you see. It doesn't always work because moves to the downside can be very sharp and very quick. But look what happened here. This is this Hewlett Packard again. Uh, this is, uh, again, this is 2010. No, it's just 2009. For some reason, did your charts? No, you didn't get the, it's missing the description. When we got up here at the top of the move to the upside on Hewlett Packard, it started to go down. The volatility started increasing uh, substantially throughout the downside. There's only one or two periods here where things flattened out. Over here is where it started to turn down. The volatility starts to fade away. And this is probably the end of the move to the downside. At that time, you know, most of the sellers have probably dumped the stock. They've got out of it. Right now, everybody's waiting for an entry point to get back in. So you're looking at a situation where the, where the volatility has been steadily rising. The 21 day for a substantial period of time has been going down. And then you suddenly start seeing this little curve and rollover. When that happens, it's probably a sign that uh, we're going to get some consolidation and maybe a move to the upside. Okay, the next one. Not, not too heavy so far this morning, right? Nothing too complex. <laughs> Start off nicely on a Sunday morning. This is um, something I've been looking at for a while, which is um, spiders exhaustion using the VIX. Now, as we know, the volatility, you know, the CBOE VIX index is a measure of the implied volatility of the S&P 500. It's a classic indicator. I mean, if you, we'll see in a moment, we overlay this on the spider itself. I mean, it's, it's almost a completely uh, opposite chart. They're a mirror image of each other. You know, when spikes in the VIX, we've seen it, when the spikes in the VIX are really, really high, it's almost always at the bottom in the market. And, and the reverse is true. When the VIX is at very, very low, you're kind of at a market top itself. Because when you look at this, this is an overlay chart. What I took was the spiders. And this is, again, this is just in the, from, uh, this is 2010. This is this year. What you're looking at here is uh, two price charts. They're just single line price charts. You've got the SPY, the spiders, overlaid with the VIX. The VIX is in the blue and the spiders are in the black. And you notice here when the spiders are right at the top of the move right here, where's the VIX? It's right down the bottom here. The volatility is extremely low. As soon as the VIX is starting to rise up here, you can see the price action of the spiders has gone to the downside. And you see this time and time again. When you get this, look at this huge spike here in the VIX right here. That coincides with this first bottom area here on the spider itself. Notice the next spike in the VIX wasn't so high, even though the next low on the uh, spider was a little bit lower. So it was, you know, it was signs that maybe we had reached a bottom at that time. But look at it again and again. The VIX reaches a low. Spiders at a high. VIX reaches a high. Spiders is at a low. Every time you see this, it's always a, you know, a, a big clue. When you see the VIX is in extreme readings, whether to the upside or downside, you know when it's an extreme reading on the VIX to the upside, you're probably close to a bottom in the, in the market. It's fairly short term, depending on how long the, the previous move has been. And the reverse is true. When the VIX is completely down here, I mean, if you see this down here on the VIX again, where the market's on long way up here, it's a sure sign that uh, volatility is just fading away. When that happens, we're near the top of a move. You know, this, this chart in of itself isn't easy to interpret for trading, which is why we're looking a little bit. I built an indicator for this. So this is what I did here. I took the uh, close of the VIX. And I plotted it as an indicator with a 21-day average of the VIX because when we were looking at the historical volatility, the 21-day gives us a nice smooth representation uh, for turning points when things are turning up or turning down. 
So I did the same with the VIX. I took the closing price of the VIX and I made that an indicator. And then I ran a 21-day average through it. So I'm building myself a VIX volatility indicator, since the VIX is already the implied volatility of the S&P 500. I'm taking this and I'm using this as an indicator for uh, entry and exit points or for tops and bottoms uh, of moves on the spider itself. You know, you can trade the spider whether it's an ETF or if you like options, trade it as an, with options on the ETF. It's hugely liquid. And this needs some testing too, because right now we haven't, uh, haven't done a huge amount of testing on this particular indicator. But what I've done is I plotted it as an indicator with a 21-day average of the VIX. And what I've noticed is uh, when you have the VIX for three or more consecutive spikes above its 21-day average that we've got running through it, followed by a change in direction from up to the down of the 21-day average, it signals an exhaustion of time to cover the shorts. So this, is, this indicator works very well when you see this happen. And it makes sense. You get the big spikes in the VIX happening as we get to the bottom of a move. That's when the volatility is the highest. When you see that happen, it's above its average. As soon as it comes back down below it and the 21 day starts turning down, you tend to see the bottom of a move. So this is it here. This is, look at all these down here. This is here. This is the VIX. So this histogram is just the value of the VIX itself, the closing value of the VIX for the day. This is the 21 day average that's running through it. So that gives us better information as far as turning points are concerned. This is a very nice little indicator when the bottom of a move is, has, has been reached. I haven't yet figured out what it can tell me on the top of a move, but we may get something on that. But let's have a look at some of these that I've highlighted. There's quite a lot on this uh, chart right here. What I'm saying is, is that you see here, for example, you get three days where it's actually above its 21-day average, followed by a turn down in the moving average itself. When you see that happen, it's usually at the bottom of a move. The spikes are the indication of the, of, the, of the increase in volatility that's happening in the marketplace. Once that volatility has been cleared out and the 21-day average starts to turn back down, that's a sign that we're losing volatility and the down move is probably over. And it happens time and time again. You get the three, three or more spikes above and the moving average turns over right at the bottom here. Same again here. You may get spikes earlier, but there's no turn down in the moving average. That's the real key. You've got spikes here, volatility spiked above, but there's none of this turn down right here that you see in the moving average, sign that the move is over. Same again here. You've got a lot of spikes going up, but there's none of the rollover. When the rollover occurs, occasionally you get a little bit of a glitch here, but on this particular one, you've got like five days above, and then once it rolls over, this is the sign the move's over. It does it time and time again. So there's kind of two factors. You want that volatility, that you want that thrust of spike of the VIX itself with the moving average turned down. That's a sign if you're in the shorts, it's time to get out. Now on the long side, this is something that I think I'm gonna look at a little bit more because on the long side, it's a little less clear because you have situations where we know the volatility on the long side, you get to the top of a move. Is this move exhausted or not? It's hard to tell with just the VIX on here. I don't get enough information because what I'm looking at, I've got the volatility very low. I get a little turn up here and it turns back down there. Uh, right now, it, it's, it doesn't give me enough information to say, can I get a clue from this indicator that I've reached the top of a move to the upside? But certainly on the downside, these spikes, they, they came readily apparent as soon as you put this 21-day average on there. You take that 21-day average off of there and a lot of these spikes that are, that are below the moving average just confuses the whole picture. But it's the 21-day average that makes it, gives you a very good indication when a move to the downside is, is finishing up. Do you see that? Is it, does it make sense? I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of cool the way it rolls over right after you get all these spikes. If it doesn't roll over and you get the spikes, then the move's not over. And it's just simple mechanics in the marketplace. It's all it is. Huge volatility, exhaustion sellers, you know, the last of the sellers have dumped everything out. Our indication that the move to the downside is over is the average, which smooths out some of the, some of the noise in there, has begun to fade away. And we know that when volatility starts fading away, it's usually when there's a move to the upside. 
Now this indicator will, uh, actually I'm going to put it on the chart at the end of the session just to show you how, how you can add it in there. Because we put an indicator on yesterday, um, did some several indicators, we put the Keltner on there on the price band. Uh, the code for this one, is it on the next page? Have I failed you? I have. Oh, okay. I'll show you how to make it. It's not that difficult to do. I'm going to show you right now because it's, a, it's just a cool indicator. The VIX, all you're doing here is you're taking an average, as I said, of the, uh, of the VIX itself. Let me bring that up. Give me a second here. and 21 day. Okay, I'm going to put it on the price chart here so you can see it, how, how this was done. Then I'll get the EDS code for you later. So here we have AIQ charts. I bring up the spider. Yeah, that's another indicator that we're not looking at today, but this is the one we want to look at here. This is a custom indicator that uh, we were just looking at. 21 day average of the VIX itself plotted underneath the spider. And once I get you the EDS code, it's a simple matter of going down to chart settings, indicator library, down to EDS indicators. And the way you do it was just like we did yesterday. We would click on add. We'd open up the uh, EDS file that I'll get to you. In this case, I've already got it in here, so I'll just show you how we uh, how I set this up. And literally, it's just a histogram with a plotted line. The histogram itself is, the, as I say, is is just the closing price action of the VIX. See, so close of the VIX. This one's got a 10-day on it. The one we've been looking at uh, in examples is a 21-day. I've tried it over different periods, but the 21 days is the best one. So when you when you have this, see I've got different spreads and different things when I've been investigating this, but I'll send you the code that's got the VIX with a 21 day average and the close of the VIX itself, so you can put this indicator underneath the spider. So it's that simple. Again, it's not one that goes on the price plot, it goes underneath the price action itself. So then you can see that all those spikes in the marketplace that we've just been looking at. Uh, how do you interpret that for the current market? That's a good question. At the, right now in the current market, volatility, uh, the 21 day average is going down. There's no spikes to the above side right now. There is this one here, remember, this is a 10 day one I'm looking at here. I'd have to change that to a 21 day. When I was experimenting with a 10 day, it's just too reactive. So you got too many signals. 21 day was much better. So I'd have to switch that back to the 21 day so we could uh, see that. I would surmise that in the 21 day average running through here, this would have smoothed this out a little bit. Uh, it may well be that we're at the top. If these spikes, if there's like three or four of these spikes still above the 21 day average and it has rolled over, then this could be a signal that we've reached the top again. I'm sorry, not the top, we're talking about a bottom. That would, yeah, so this, this doesn't tell me anything at the moment, because what we look at, when the, we get the spikes and the rollover, it's at the bottoms. We're in a move to the upside, so I don't, I don't have any information on, on you know, what this will tell me right at the moment. More research needed on that.
So there it is with a 21-day average. And I think, you know, the, the one I looked at, you saw all different values, was trying different things in there. The 21-day is, is, seems to be the best one for at least picking these short-term moves to the downside when they're over. If anybody's got any ideas how to find the top side with the volatility and, and the VIX in there, let me know. Oh, I need to switch that back on. Okay, so the next one we've done, you know, that was the, that's kind of the, just the specialty one on the market, which is kind of good, as I say, for picking those moves to the downside when they're over. We looked a little bit uh, briefly about a historical volatility exit, because we have that indicator in the software, it works uh, fairly well. Short exits on volatility spikes above the 21-day average. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking the research I did on the VIX and applying that interpretation and throwing it at just at a regular volatility indicator. So I can use that as, 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 as a sort of exit tool for regular stocks. Because I can't really take the VIX and apply it, uh, that indicator underneath Apple. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Apple's a different creature from the spiders. It, it does different things. So what I did was I looked at the historical volatility and said, OK, so that 21-day average is pretty good. Uh, when I saw the VIX with its spikes above its 21-day average and then rolling over, it's a good exit for shorts. So let's go and have a look and see how the regular historical volatility, which is, is a different measurement from the VIX, because the VIX is, is the, you know, the S&P 500 implied volatility. Let's see if this gets, uh, gets us any information of when a move to the upside, or in case of the, the spikes, the move to the downside is over. As I made a note down here, the spikes only really help us in short positions. I've yet to see a measure in volatility that helps me much on the upside moves. So what we're looking at here, here's Microsoft. This period covers from uh, mid-2008 uh, all the way through to uh, early September. It's a fairly long-range price chart. This is the standard volatility indicator again, where we've got a 21-day average that's running through it. And so I'm trying to apply what I learned from the VIX indicator to this as a possible indication that uh, the move to the downside is exhausted. So we're looking again at a series of spikes above the moving average. That's okay in itself. We get a lot of that when there's a strong move to the downside. What we're waiting for is for this to roll over to indicate that the move may be over. And you see this happening and it's pretty good. Again, this right here, once it turns over, this particular move turns into a trading range for a while. Right here again, we got all these spikes. Spikes are good as we're moving down, but once we get the 21 day turning over, we're pretty close to the bottom of a move again. Not quite as you know, nice and accurate as, as the uh, VIX was, but works pretty good. Again, we're looking at downside moves, because you get these types of things happening when there's, look at this here, you've got the volatility is increasing here, and it kind of just sort of flattens out and turns over here, but we're moving to the upside. It doesn't tell me anything. This works really well, again, when you have a move to the downside. You get these spikes above the uh, 21 day, and when it starts to roll over, that's over. So it just makes sense. You've got the, again, you've got this great big move going down. You've got a huge increase in volatility. The volatility starts to dry up. The spikes are a sign that we're in a good down move. Once 21 day turns over, that's the end of it. Same again over here. You've got a pretty, this is, you know, this is the classic May one again, but right down the bottom here, look at this here. You've got the volatility is above the 21 day all the time, but there's no turn down in the 21 day until we get right here. When we get to that point, just past the bottom there, bang, you get nice signals again. So it works pretty good. I think, you know, again, with this is, I've never looked at the t volatility indicator in this light. And I had never really noticed this until I took the VIX and threw the VIX up there with a 21 day, or well, I'd experimented with the other averages. And you do get some great indications. And again, but it's all on short moves. You know, forget it. You see this happening, as I say, happening here when the moves to the upside. It doesn't tell us anything. But on the short moves to the downside, these great big spikes above the moving average with the rollover in the 21 day, nice signals. How does it work on the hourly chart? No idea. I haven't got that far. Hourly chart. That'll, that'll be, be interesting to see. You can... You know what? Probably as long as as long as uh, you know it's, it's a, obviously a liquid stock, there shouldn't be a problem.
because the only problem with you know the early early hourly hourlies will be all right because you've got good trading range. It's probably not going to be hugely spiking above because you know how you, on the real time you can get a price range that's very huge every now and then, and that can just blow the volatility indicator out of its range. But here's um, you know here's again we'd have to look at the hour. Here's PFE with volatility, same type of thing. You get lots of times when it's when it's above its 21 day average, but for short players it's when it's above the average and you get the turn down. That's the sign that the move's over. Same again over here. This is you know a huge move to the downside on PFE. Very very big move down. Volatility is above its 21 day average all the way along here, but then it just turns around here and that move is over. This down move here is the same type of thing. You get all the spikes above here. This is all good for a down move. And it still stays going up. Notice how the average is still, it's shallowed out a bit, but it hasn't rolled over. Then it rolls over just after the down move has just finished. Seems to do it time and time again. It's, it's a very cool indicator. And again, it's all on the short side. And volatility has always been that way. It's always been very powerful. You know, it's, it's the fear factor that drives that, that drives that range higher on each day and pushes the prices down. And when we get down towards the bottom there, there once, once that the sellers have been you know, picked off and taken out, there are signs that things are going to turn around. The 21-day average gives us just that little smoothing signal. It's never going to be 100% exactly at the bottom because it is an average, but it at least gives us a sign what it gives us a sign of is that the spikes in volatility are beginning to fade away. And then it's the point when it turns over, that's kind of the signal when the move to the downside is exhausted. Any questions on the on volatility? You could run a scan uh, to see three spikes above twenty one day. I think you could because you, and you also have to be I, I was looking at doing that and it, it's um because there may be day one's a spike, day two isn't, day three, day four is a spike. It's, um, in most cases, it's almost like you need three out of four days of spikes, because you may occasionally get one that doesn't get up in there, but you could, you could write a scan for that very easily. Uh, you know, that's the, the initial trigger, is you've got three out of four spikes, uh, but during that time, you're going to have to have the 21-day average is still going up. Because that's 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 the crucial factor here, and all of these here, this is the initial trigger. Is the spikes above here? I get three days in a row above here, but it's still moving up. So I'm going to get hits all the time, all the way up here on that initial scan. But what I'm really looking for is for that to have occurred. Once I find a date and time, and I've gone back. Oh, okay. The last four days, I've had three spikes above the moving average. Now I'm waiting for the moving average to have been going up and then turned down. So you've got to get that relationship's got to be in place because you know there's times when this thing turns up and turns down when you don't have spikes. So so once those two factors are together, I think it's it it can be written. Yeah, be interesting to test it. Steve? Yeah. Why do you keep saying that this is an end of a short? I mean, this volatility stuff's funny anyway because volatility should just mean movement. But the way it's used in stocks is, if the thing's going down, it's got high volatility. If it's going up to the moon, it's got low volatility. Well, to me, both of those things are volatility, but that's the way the stuff is measured. So, or, or called. Called, yes. Yeah. Called. Na miscalled. Naming, miscalled. naming so, is a convention, so yeah. So why wouldn't you, I, mean, I don't know what your trigger in to short these guys was, but why wouldn't you use these volatility spikes to enter longs as you closed out shorts. And let's see what the difference is. Oh. Why are they so much better for shorts than they are for just going long? No, you, you, you're right, you could. I mean, at, uh, what I was doing here was was looking at exhaustions of moves. Okay, so that, point, that, that's that, that's, that's the talk. I was going to say, for yeah. God's sake, Steve, you're giving up half yeah, the money. Yeah, no, no, exactly. And that's what I'm doing here is that that's it. But like we saw earlier when we were looking at um, the, the expansion, the, the gap, the exhaustion gap, it's a great short opportunity. So, you know, it, it's the same thing. When a, when a move's gone from one side, you can always play the other side. So you, you're good, yeah. I'm, I mean, so I'm focused on that. We could do another session and say, we could relabel this session and I could reverse it all and say, hey, these are great, these are great opportunities to go long or short. But no, this, you're, yeah, it's a good point. But you're right, this would be, this is kind of interesting for that too, because 
every time you get this little rollover, especially after these spikes like here, you could probably look at going long. I hadn't really looked at it because I wasn't, that wasn't the theme, but uh, nice, I like it. I mean, it's, it's, it's something I hadn't looked at before. I hadn't seen, you know, I read stocks and commodities. It's like my, uh, you know, it's one of two magazines I read is Stocks and Commodities and The Economist. And there, there couldn't be two more different magazines. <laughs> I mean, The Economist is a great magazine. I don't know if anybody gets The Economist. It's, uh, you know, to me, it's probably the, the best summarized worldwide news without all the, without all the, the inflaming and all the, the, you know, the media hype. Uh, as it, you know, I read it every week. It's, it's, it's extremely in-depth. Um, whereas the stocks and commodities, you, after the first article, I generally fall asleep because it's just so complex. But there's always some gems in there somewhere, and then you, you always pick out things. And, and I hadn't seen you know, much on volatility recently because uh, they've seen that they move a lot into doing currency things. They do some very esoteric stuff. Uh, it, it, gets, you know, it gets a little too complex. I look, simplicity, I think, is, is always the best. Things I can understand, I find, are really, really important. And this I understand. You know, I understand what happens when the sellers have all have given up. And this is just a simple measure of it. So we've got one more to do in here on volume exhaustion. And we saw this in a, in a couple of the examples we looked at. When you get to the end of a move, especially to the, um, you know, the peak of a move to the upside, the volume just fades away. So again, I look for the, you know, today's volume ESA to be highest for 21 days is a good indication. Because volume spikes on their own, you know, there's just too much noise. So go back down and look at the 21-day average of it and wait, wait for that to reach, uh, to reach a, a particularly high level. Here's some EDS code for that. Very simple uh, code here. All I'm looking for, it's a new volume high. If the high result of the volume average of the 21-day equals the volume ESA, I would probably substitute... Um, I want the, uh, this not to be equal. It doesn't have to be exactly equal, the ESA. What I'm really looking for is it to be um, greater than or equal. So what we're seeing here, you know, this, this, all this is is looking at a new high volume peak. So in this one here, you know, we, we looked at the tops of moves. You tend to get different types of volume things happening at tops and at bottom of moves. So this is a SLB with 21-day high volume ESA exit. Again, it's you know it's very interesting. You get these little volume peaks here. You can see the ESA suddenly pops up here, right at the bottom of this particular move here. Over here, you get it up towards the uh, to the top of the move. Down here, we saw the huge increase in volume. This is a 21-day high in the uh, in the ESA volume. And it's again, it's right after the bottom of the move here. It's not a bad indicator. It's not as good as the volatility, I find. But it's, again, when you see that, if you run a scan with uh, looking for high 21-day volume ESA exits, <laughs> you could use it for trading shorts, <laughs> especially up here, or trading long down here. The, you know what's interesting about this is that you get these, unlike um, huge moves to the upside where your volume fades away, sometimes you get this volume thing happening right at the top the beginning of the down move. You get that sudden spike in the 21-day average volume right here. So in this particular case here, you've had a great move to the upside. Look at the volume fade over here. This is kind of the sign that uh, we're beginning to have a real breakdown. We've, the move is over, really, over here. The volume has become you know, fairly anemic right here. The volume's faded away at the top of the move. But this is the sign that things are beginning to pick up again. You know, none of us can grab the tops of these moves if we want to go short. But again, if you see this right here, the volume is starting to pick up. You've had three days to the downside. You're still long this stock. You probably want to get, uh, get out of it or, or at least uh, be very tight on your stops at that time. We know that volume tends to peak as well at the bottom of a move. So again, this 21 ESA fires again when it's down here. Could be a good entry. I don't know. Right here, we got the same again, right at the top of this move here. Yeah. Have you ever considered looking at um, volume moves that are, say, out of two sigma from the 21-day average rather than trying to pick up, gee, this is a spike, just let it... Yeah, well, this is, yeah, this is not really a spike one, though. This one is a, this is, what we're looking here is uh, the 21-day 
average ESA has reached a new high, 21. So what we're doing is it's a 21-day high of the 21-day average. It could be. It, it, it could be. I mean, it could be. But, but you do still have 21 days of 21 days. So you've kind of got a double smoothing in there. So maybe even though the spikes, you know, you're talking about sigma, yeah, maybe you could look at that as... as yeah. Well, I, I tend to look, you know, the thing with 20, you know, 21 days seems to be the most common number that's ever flown around. And, it, and part of it is to do because it's a trading month. It's almost a full trading month. And I think that's some sort of, there's a psychological reason in there. You know, it's 21 days. Um, it doesn't, you, know, you could experiment. I've done a lot of testing over the years with different types of constants and in different indicators. And, and you can end up getting yourself stuck in this horrible loop. <laughs> and, and then you lose sight of what you're trying to do because you know, every result moves everything to a new frame. It's like having different universes around you, and you're trying to get the same goal, but each of them does different things. Um, I try to stick to simplicity, because I don't want overly complex stuff, because it, I just find the more complex it gets, the more likely it is to break, the more likely it is not to be real. I find things that are simple, like volume and volatility make perfect sense. Fear and greed are great. And if then, you know, you can measure that with volatility and you can measure somewhat with volume. Uh, volume can be, you know, as you say, hugely spiky, but by throwing the ESA in there, you make your life a little easier. You're smoothing out some of those spikes. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of different things you can uh, look at. Uh, but I'm always looking, you know, volatility is the big thing. Uh, volume, you know, huge volume spikes or, or volume ESA like this is really a sign that there's, you know, something's happening. The move may be over. Things are changing. Here's AXP with a 21-day high volume ESA exits again. You've got interesting, mi oops, wrong way, interesting mixture of signals here again. This is the ESA. It's a 21-day high right here. You've had this huge blowout on uh, on AXP at this point here. So again, you know something's bound to settle out here. And again, up here you've got this. Instead of this volume fade on this move up to the upside. This volume has been fairly consistent. It's kind of just faded away a little bit on this really, really huge uh, draw up. The, the volume started to increase. And again, I'm just looking at the average to give me my indications here. But at this point here, we're at a 21-day high in that, uh, in that ESA itself. You know, and again, it's a, that's a real signal that maybe the volume, we've really reached the end of something here. What drove this one, I think, was this it's runaway, this is one of our runaway uh, fly bars up here, followed by this very steep drawback. You know, the volume just went crazy on that particular day. Right down the bottom here, we've had a s substantial rise up on the uh, volume as this move to the downside has continued. We've reached a peak over here. So again, it's possible this is the end of the, of the volume of the sellers coming in and getting, you know, dumping the stock. Maybe this move is over again. So volume peaks, uh, you know, I find them less uh, useful than VIX. The VIX uh, as an indicator or the 21-day historical volatility, that ESA, with the spikes running through it, that seems to be a, a very, very good indicator. Other signs of exhaustion, you know, volume fades at top. We saw that in some of those, uh, on these examples we had earlier. Uh, another one is uh, narrowing, narrowing of the range days at tops. That makes perfect sense because as the volume dries up, the buyers and sellers, we saw that with the, uh, with the doji. Once you get those narrowing of ranges happening, th there's no more slides after this one, by the way. This is pretty much the, uh, the end. I didn't put any examples up here because we really looked at this earlier. But these are the same things, the doji. And as I was saying earlier about the doji being, while it is a candlestick pattern, it's really this narrowing of the range until you get almost no range whatsoever in the day, or hardly any range in the day. Um, you still get some high and low, but it's just a small little star. And you know that's just a sign that uh, we've reached the end of a, of a move to the upside, and quite often to the downside. And the volume, as we saw in some of those examples, when you get a fade out at the top there, there's no more buyers left. So no one wants to buy the stock anymore. So that's a sign, again, that it's, that it's exhausted its move. 
Well, that's it for this morning. Fairly straightforward, easy session. You got any questions? Fire away. If not, we'll uh, take an early break so I can uh, relax for five minutes. <laughs> no, any questions you got? Fire, fire away at me. I'll uh, I'll endeavour to answer them. <laughs>